Right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, sorry about that. We had a quick little technical difficulty in getting set up, um, but wanted to thank you all so much for joining. Um, I'll start off at the top. Uh, my name is Ralph Bouquet, and I'm the Director of Education and Outreach for NOVA, the PBS Science Documentary Series uh, produced at WGH in Boston. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking you all for, uh, for tuning in to today's virtual field trip um, and really for uh, um, for especially to the teachers and the students who are currently engaged in uh, distant learning uh, during this uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, I know this is a challenging moment for many of us in so many different ways and I appreciate y'all taking the time to join us today and hope everyone is continuing to stay safe at home um, and maintaining appropriate social distancing and hygiene practices. Uh, we will get through this and thank you all so much for showing up and participating and joining uh, this virtual field trip. Um, Today, we are so excited to host Dr. Kelly M. Brunt uh, for our first virtual field trip in April. Um, and just to remind you all, um, this series is part um, of a virtual field trip campaign that we're doing uh, associated with the Polar Extremes Project. Um, the Polar Extremes film is a two hour NOVA film about uh, the science of the climate at the poles and really sort of understanding how uh, the environment, the climates uh, or climate changes happen in the poles and how that can help us better understand sort of what our future is going to be. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's a really, really incredible project. Uh, it includes a two hour special, uh, the Antarctic Extreme series, which is streaming on YouTube on PBS Terra. And then of course the Polar Lab, uh, which is a really immersive um, uh, game that uh, really sort of uh, takes students uh, to amazing, incredible sites uh, across the globe to really understand and uncover the mystery of, of how the climate has changed in the poles and how and what that could tell us about uh, the changes we can expect in the future. And so um, our virtual field trips are generally opportunities for us to connect you all with scientists who are doing incredible work in the field. Um, obviously uh, due to sort of the current global situation, um, we aren't really able to have scientists be out in the field and sort of report and uh, live stream from the field. Um, but today we're really excited because we are gonna be hosting a conversation with Dr. Kelly M. Brunt, who is an associate research scientist with the Earth System Science Interdisciplinary Center at the University of Maryland and the Chirospheric Sciences Laboratory at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, she's part of the NASA Ice Cloud and Land Elevation Satellite, uh, AKA ISAT-2 mission. Um, and ISAT-2 is essentially a say, satellite laser altimeter um, which is basically an instrument used to measure the altitude of an object above a fixed level. Um, and that is essentially working to determine the changes in our polar regions uh, with centimeter, centimeter level accuracy uh, from space. And so her role with the mission is really to help validate uh, the elevation data, uh, make sure that it's accurate. Uh, and she does that by actually going into the field uh, to Antarctica. Uh, and her broader interests um, uh, include sort of remote sensing and modeling of ice sheets um, um, at the poles. And so we're really, really excited to have uh, Dr. Kelly M. Brunt uh, join us today for this conversation. And so I'm gonna hand it off to her. And basically the way this is gonna work is she's gonna do a brief uh, presentation, sort of outlining the work that she does. She's gonna share some really cool videos, uh, images of the work that she does out in the field. Um, and then uh, we're gonna take a couple of questions from the audience. And so please, if you do have a question, um, in the comment section, you can just submit your question there and we will, uh, and I'll make sure to ask that question uh, to Dr. Brunt. So um, yeah, I'll hand it off to her and uh, please enjoy the presentation and please feel free to ask questions in the comments. Hey, thank you so much, Ralph. That was an awesome uh, introduction. Uh, I, I'm Kelly Brunt. I, uh, I'm an associate research scientist with the University of Maryland and NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I'm coming to you today from uh, New Hampshire at my sister's house, uh, as everybody out there I'm sure is doing similarly, um, sort of quarantining <laughs> with family. Uh, and I actually got to see probably what everybody else is going through right now. I got to watch Ralph and WGBH and Nova folks kind of work through some technical difficulties. And I really wanna thank them for that. It was awesome. Um, and I'm sure we're all out there suffering through the same type of stuff. So hang in there uh, and we'll get through this and hopefully today we'll have a little bit of fun and enjoy a little virtual tour. So I'm a, uh, I'm a researcher with NASA and the University of Maryland. I'm specifically a glaciologist. I study glaciers. Uh, specifically, I like the polar regions, the, uh, the, the north, er north area, mostly like Greenland 
but especially the southern area, the Antarctic ice sheet. That's one of my favorite uh, things to look at. Not many people have worked with or spoken to a glaciologist. So the question I get a lot is, oh my gosh, how did you get into that field? I think if I were to really, you know, wind back the clock and take a, take a good look, uh, I grew up in Connecticut and my family really liked to ski. A lot of our vacations were associated with skiing. We'd run up to Vermont and have a good time. Um, I then went to Syracuse as an undergraduate, got a BS degree in geology. I also skied for Syracuse, so that was fantastic. Um, the Syracuse area is loaded with these landforms such as drumlins or kind of the landscape left as the North American ice sheets retreated. So I saw, of what, I saw a lot of what we call glacial geomorphology or the, the way the landscape looks after the, the uh, ice sheets have gone away. I then went to the University of Montana for a master's degree also in geology. Montana is great for skiing, so that helped too. That was fantastic. <laughs> I studied paleomagnetism or sort of how some of our uh, mountains kind of formed and twisted and whatnot um, through plate tectonics. That was pretty cool. I then worked for uh, seven years doing remote sensing and GIS at both the USGS in uh, Anchorage, Alaska and with the US Antarctic program based in Denver, but also uh, in Antarctica, which is pretty cool. And then I went back to school for a PhD in geophysics and specifically glaciology, looking at sort of large scale ice sheet flow. So that's kind of how I got here. Um, I'm gonna share some uh, photos with you now, which will be fun. Um, this is just kind of covering what we were just talking about, uh, the, the emphasis on skiing. I really think that this is what did it. Uh, this is what made me sort of interested in ice and cold type places. And we'll just kind of move ahead because we can stop looking at pictures from the 70s and 80s and everybody's hair back there was interesting. Let's just get into the heart of this, what you guys really want to talk about, and that's the science. As Ralph said, I work specifically with a mission called ISAT2. ISAT-2, as Ralph said, is a satellite laser altimeter. So let's break those up. So it's a satellite. It's, uh, it's in sort of a, a near Earth orbit. It's about 500 kilometers off the ground. That's about 300 miles. Um, it's an altimeter, as Ralph said. Uh, basically, it's determining very accurately, very precisely. We'll get to that in a second. But it's determining the elevation or the altitude of the surface down below. And it's doing that with a laser, that's the laser component. So ISAT-2 uh, is operating a single laser that's split into six beams. So it gives us good kind of what we call a cross track coverage. We've got these six beams that sort of flare out and give us a little bit more data. Um, ultimately, what we're doing with, this is a, a cool video put out by NASA. I know it's probably a little bit choppy for you guys, sorry, hang with it. Um, but this is kind of how that satellite after, after launch got got operational. Ultimately, we're really interested in, among other things, looking at changes in the surface in our polar regions. Why do we care so much about our polar regions? They're so far away. Let's talk about that. Two, two of the main goals of ISA 2 are one, to look at changes in our sea ice, and two, to look at changes in our, our grounded, our land ice, our ice sheets. So changes in our sea ice, here we are, most of us are probably watching from North America just because of time zones and whatnot. Um, but here in North America, the polar regions seem very far away. Changes in sea ice seem a little bit you know, remote. Ultimately, changes in sea ice uh, have a huge impact on global weather patterns. You can imagine if you remove that cap of sea ice, uh, you actually change the moisture flux between the ocean and the atmospheres, and that has an impact on global weather. We're not gonna to talk too much about sea ice in this, but that is one of the main polar aspects of this mission. The other one is the one we are gonna talk about, changes in our ice sheets. So uh, the, the continent of Antarctica is about the size, uh, you know, a, a bit larger than the continental United States. And we're looking at changes in that surface with centimeter level accuracy and centimeter level precision. Small, small changes over that much area constitute a large impact on mean sea level rise. And that's why we're interested in, in uh, changes in our ice sheets. That affects a huge proportion of the world's population. So let's really be very specific about accuracy and precision. And I, I'm sure some of you guys remember this cool little cartoon that kind of defines the, the, uh, the two and, and their differences. Accuracy, 
that that target on the left shows an arrow right in the bullseye. That's when you're being accurate. That's what you're going for. Hey, you know, if you want to win the game, you're heading for the center of the target. Precise is a little bit different. You might be able to hit the, tar the target once, but can you repeatedly hit that target? So that picture in the center is precise or high repeatability. Uh, the, the arrows are clustering. And then the figure way over on the right represents both, both accurate, hitting the target right in the center and precise, being able to repeat that measurement. So throughout this talk, we'll be talking about accuracy and precision. When I'm talking about accuracy, I'm talking about how well the satellite is able to get to uh, what we consider ground truth and precision is how often it can repeat that precise, that accurate measurement. Makes sense? Excellent. <laughs> All right, so uh, ISAT2, basically what's my role in ISAT2? That's basically to assess or, or confirm how well we're doing with respect to our mission goals. So here you see an animation, and again, it's probably a little bit choppy, I apologize. Uh, basically, this is just the ISAT-2 satellite laying down all of its orbits. Those are represented by the green tracks here. Ultimately, you can see it's in it, what we call a polar orbit. It comes really close to hitting the north and south poles. Ultimately, it misses a little bit, but if you look right near the poles, that's where the data are most dense. That's where the tracks converge. That's where you're getting that really bright ping uh, in, the, in that final image that you're seeing on screen. So all of the tracks are converging down there. You don't have to travel a very long distance uh, to hit a lot of what we call the ground tracks or the little lines that you're seeing here. So what we do is we actually go down to that really bright green part of that circle. And that's what I'm showing in the lower left here. We drive down to that circle, drive a stretch of it, and then collect data along the way and use that data to assess how the satellite's doing. We call this, this traverse, this drive that we do, which is represented by the red triangle and the figure on the left. Uh, we call this, this traverse here, this um, uh, uh, red triangle, we call that the 88 South Traverse. So to do this, we actually fly all the way to the South Pole, then we get in vehicles and we drive away. So we get to the South Pole um, over the course of many, many days, it feels like, but we fly using commercial airlines uh, all the way to New Zealand. That takes quite a bit of time. That's you know 13,000 kilometers or 8,000 miles. Then we fly a bunch of military aircraft uh, to get onto the continent and, and then into the center of the continent. So uh, the past couple of years, I've been flying to the edge of Antarctica to a place called McMurdo Station with the Royal New Zealand Air Force. Uh, once we're at McMurdo, and you can see it as that little point right there on the, uh, on the coast of Antarctica, uh, once we're at McMurdo, we collect our gear, we get training, uh, we ship all everything to the pole, the South Pole, excuse me, including ourselves, uh, and we get to the South Pole via the U.S. Air National Guard. And they fly these pretty good sized aircraft that are actually equipped with skis on the bottom, uh, which is pretty cool. So it allows them to land in the center of the ice sheet. And then finally, we get in these vehicles called piston bullies, and I've got some photos for you in a second. Uh, but we get in these vehicles uh, called piston bullies and we drive about 750 kilometers, which is about 450 miles uh, around in that little triangle and return to pole and then reverse the whole operation to get home. So I guess one of the big things I want to, uh, to have you guys take away is that Antarctica, it, it looks just stark and kind of barren, but it is absolutely gorgeous. I think that the beauty of it comes from that stark and barren landscape. For the most part, some of the, the drama associated with your day-to-day -day comes from the atmosphere, which is pretty cool. So I want you to take a look at this flat surface here and realize that from 500 kilometers up, our satellite is able to determine that surface to a centimeter level accuracy and centimeter level precision. A centimeter is about the thickness of a pencil. So I wanna repeat those numbers again. From 500 kilometers up, <laughs> we're able to determine the accuracy of the elevation of that surface to about one centimeter. That is crazy. And I think that's pretty cool. That's part of the awesome part of the science. And it's my job to then drive with these uh, instruments, these GPS instruments to actually validate that we're getting that centimeter level accuracy. So what we do is we end up driving on this traverse, you see the piston bully out front, 
And what we're dragging behind us is our entire camp setup. And then on the very back, I think you can probably see a little stick and you'll see it better in a couple other uh, images and videos, but that little stick has an antenna on top and that antenna is collecting GPS data. You guys all have GPS uh, instruments in your car. It's telling you where you're going and how, far, how long it's gonna take you to get there, all that good stuff. Those GPSs that are in your car have about five meter accuracy, you know, about 15 foot accuracy. Um, the GPS that I use uh, has much better accuracy, much better precision. And if I wait to process these data for, you know, two, three weeks after collecting the data, then I can get down to centimeter level accuracy and centimeter level precision, which is exactly what I need to make statements about the accuracy and, and precision of the satellite data. So all we do is drive across the Antarctic ice sheet, collecting that type of data so that instrument is constantly running. I'm gonna show you a couple of videos that are kind of fun and then we'll talk about our day-to-day -day activities. This, so when, when the, we get support from uh, the National Science Foundation from the US Antarctic program, they came up with this crazy idea that we were gonna take these vehicles and drag these sleds with our camp set up uh, over 750 kilometers. And I thought they were nuts. And lo and behold, it worked and it worked really, really well. And this is just a video to kind of show you how smoothly uh, it, it went, which is kind of nice. The next video is you can see, uh, we've, when we're down there, it's daylight all the time because we go down there December, January, it, but that's the Southern hemisphere. So it's daylight all the time, as opposed to um, you know, being in the winter time, it's actually their summer. Uh, it's about, I always get asked what the temperatures are, what the wind is. So the temperatures here are about minus 15 to minus 20 degrees Celsius. And that ends up being like, you know, five degrees Fahrenheit to minus five degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the wind, that's really what dictates what your temperature is gonna be like. For the most part, you know, we have pretty steady low winds, maybe five knots, uh, maybe a little bit more. On really bad days, then it's up to about 20 knots, but it's not, it's not wicked, uh, mostly because we're at the top of the ice sheet, the center of the ice sheet, kind of where uh, the weather starts. Um, and it hasn't really had time to spin up and spin off topography and get, get crazy. Um, the other thing that people don't always think of when, when they think about these trips is that we're actually at about 10,000 feet above sea level. The center of the ice sheet is really, really high. So when you fly from the coast, you know, zero feet above sea level, to right into the pole, that's actually a hard, hard transition. You're basically going to altitude very quickly. But that's sort of the environment. Uh, you're high up, it's pretty cold. It's not too windy, but the wind has an impact on your day-to-day -day temperatures. I think this is just a little fun video here. Uh, this is a super nice day. That's one of my colleagues. He's actually the project scientist for the satellite I'm on. And he's, I don't know why he's navigating for us. He's telling us, hey, we wanna go this way. <laughs> Hey, I think we should head over that way. Um, what I like about this is you can see, first of all, he's wearing a baseball hat. Uh, we're pretty comfortable during the day when you're in the vehicles and you've got a nice day going. Uh, you know, when you get out and you start to do stuff, then you have to bundle up. But for the most part, we're actually pretty comfortable. That makes my mom feel better about this and sleep a little easier at night. Here's another good shot. There's a little bit more wind in this image. That's why the snow is kicking up off of the front of the, uh, the vehicle. And here's a really good shot of one of the GPSs off the back of the of the sled train. So that's that's literally the, the big daddy instrument associated with this science project is that antenna and the GPS data that we're collecting. These are sleep tents, the three yellow tents that you see there on the vehicle that I'm on. That's where we're hauling the kitchen tent, couple, you know, couple things of cargo and a bathroom tent. So when all is said and done uh, and we've collected all that data, I bring it home and uh, basically I process the data that takes about two weeks. Let's talk about that. We're basically collecting GPS data steadily for two weeks. So it's two weeks of time times 24 hour day, a day, 60 minutes an hour, 60 seconds a minute. And we're collecting data twice every second. And we're doing that on two vehicles. You add all that up, multiply all that out and you get about 5 million data points strictly associated with just the GPS data. And that's crazy. Um, the satellite data we're collecting is even denser. So we're, we're basically comparing very large data sets against very large data sets. And we do that in high-end computing software. In this case, I'm showing you MATLAB. Um, that's what I happen to be using for this. It's kind of where I've uh, built
up a lot of my code over the years. Uh, other folks out there are probably more familiar with things like Python, which is a fantastic tool. I encourage everybody that's jumping into STEM, if you're going to learn a, a coding language, I highly encourage you to jump into Python. Uh, it's fantastic. But so I process these data, I make the comparisons. Um, that takes a little bit of processing time on the computers. It's not horrible. And this is this is basically the end result. What you're looking at here is a time series. Uh, on the left, we're going from about October of 2018. And on the right, we're coming up to about March 1st of 2020. So this is basically just a comparison of all the ISAT-2 satellite elevation data. And that's referred to in this as ATL-03. It's a data product associated with, with the ISAT-2 mission. But it's all of the ATL-03 data relative to the GPS data through time. So the bias that you see on the left there is, is under that sort of, that's the bias is in meters. So 0.1 is kind of in the heart of what we're looking at. That's under 10 centimeters of bias and the precision looks pretty tight. So we're getting close to, even in the early days of this satellite mission, we're actually getting close to that centimeter level accuracy, centimeter level um, precision that's, that is our goal uh, ultimately for, for the ISAT-2 mission. So this is sort of the big enchilada. This is what we're going for. And you can see the numbers that I have there in the lower left really you know, hammering home how well we're doing. I want to make a couple of statements about, you know, it's, it's pretty cool to be able to go to Antarctica. It's pretty cool to be able to work for NASA. Let me tell you about the team that, that goes out on the 88 South Traverse. That's me on the left. That's another researcher on the very far right in the red jacket. We both work at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And with us on this is a mechanic in the lower right and a medic in the lower left. This just represents the folks that are going out onto the ice sheet. Uh, ultimately, there are also behind us, there's this whole station, this whole community that helps land aircraft, you know, feed, house people, provide science support, all this great stuff, provide weather support. That's critically important. The point is, is everyone here, the, 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 the common ground between all these people is that they really, really love what they do. So my point, my overall point is that there are many, many different paths to get you to say Antarctica or to work at NASA or to work on a project like this. Many different paths. I think the, the take home though is really enjoy what you do. Find what you, what you like doing, do it well. And honestly, things like this uh, uh, can fall in front of you. It's, it's just a fantastic place to work and it re represents a lot of very diverse backgrounds that got to this point. I'll also say one of the things I like to tell uh, all students actually is some of the uh, math that I've been working with uh, heavily over the past couple of years has been statistics. Um, I, as a, as a math or a science major, we tend to obsess more with like our calculus curriculums and we forget about our statistics. And I think when you talk to a lot of uh, researchers in, in these various fields, they really think that statistics is still kind of missing uh, from our backgrounds. So I would encourage everybody to take just a little bit more statistics to complement your, your calculus series. Um, and then the last thing, both Gina and Ralph asked, to, asked me to put uh, some exciting or some dramatic type stuff in here. And this is just a little footage of, uh, you know, when things go right, uh, it's great. But when things go wrong, we had some vehicle issues this year and a plane had to come into our camp and uh, with carrying two mechanics and do some quick um, uh, maintenance on our machine. The first thing I'll say is that for that plane to come in, we also had to groom that ski way that you see. So I now put that on my resume. <laughs> I, uh, I have groomed an Antarctic ski way. <laughs> so we groomed that, which meant that we uh, used a lot of the fuel that we had. So they had to actually bring us more fuel as well. So now they're fixing our vehicle. They're bringing more fuel out into the field. Uh, that's just a, a loop of the same footage. And then three mechanics, the mechanic that we had on our traverse plus two that flew out into the deep field worked on our vehicle and it was fantastic. They got us up and rolling again in about three hours. So here's the whole camp overview. Um, they worked really hard to get us going again. Um, I would say that when you're working with the US Antarctic program, you know, my mother is always concerned, you know, is it dangerous? <laughs> I would say they give you a lot of the training and a lot of the, the resources that you need to go out in the field. So I don't think that you feel that, that you know, you're really out there on your own. And when things like this happen, when you have problems in the field and they have to come out and, and work with you, uh, it feels good that, you know, well, it kind of stinks when you have the trouble. I don't mean that, but it feels good that you know that somebody 
uh, is looking out for you and they and they're able to come out into the field pretty quickly and pretty easily. So um, it's it's certainly not the end of the world. This was the last slide I had, um, and I think uh, Ralph uh, and his folks are probably going to open it up somewhat to questions if there's uh, any questions out there. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Um, yeah, so we are definitely taking questions now. So if you do have a question, um, please uh, put it in the comments um, of this stream. Uh, and again, for those of you who just joined us, again, this is uh, how to support a satellite from the South Pole. Um, a virtual field trip featuring Dr. Kelly M. Brunt uh, from NASA uh, talking about the research that she does uh, in the field in Antarctica to uh, confirm uh, measurements uh, of ice levels uh, from the ISAT-2 satellite. Um, so again, uh, while we're waiting for some questions, um, I do have a few of my own that I wanted to ask. Um, the first question being, um, as a scientist who does work sort of collecting uh, this very important climate change data, uh, what would you say are some of the most important things that students should understand um, about the changes that we're seeing in places like Antarctica and the North Pole? That's a that's a great question. So let's focus on Antarctica. I think, honestly, I talked about how changes in sea ice uh, have an impact on weather and changes in our land ice have, or grounded ice sheets have an impact on mean sea level rise. I actually think the changes in our sea ice are going to have a greater impact on a larger percentage of our population in a time scale that's relevant for our lifetimes. I do think changes in sea ice are probably more important from that perspective. Unfortunately, I know more about the changes in our land ice, so we're gonna focus on that. <laughs> um, I guess what I would want people to know is that what often makes the news uh, with respect to changes in Antarctica are major, major iceberg calving events. And, and it's, those are insane uh, with respect to their size and the drama. I consider those to be the earthquakes of our field. <laughs> you know, people get excited about those big geophysical events and a, the calving of a large iceberg, and we tend to measure them in units of like New York City or, you know, Man the island of Manhattan. Those are really exciting and dramatic. But honestly, it's when we really have a centimeter of change over an entire continent, that is far more meaningful. Believe it or not, iceberg calving is part of the equation of snow coming in and working its way out. What's not part of the equation is the whole lowering of the entire continent. So that's where we need to sort of put in balance uh, our concern and our focus. So if, if students take one thing away, it's that icebergs are awesome, icebergs are really cool, but icebergs are part of the natural process. Surface lowering, which we're measuring with ISAT 2 is where we really wanna have a better understanding of how things are changing and how fast. I guess another question is sort of uh, on that note, as sort of you start to get more data, as the field starts to change, um, what do you feel is sort of the next big thing, whether it's a, an idea or, or, or an advancement in technology that you're using, um, uh, what's the sort of that next big thing in your field? So really sort of tangential to ISAT2, um, let's remember that ISAT2 is only measuring the surface. It's using lasers to just ping a signal off of the surface of the ice sheet back up to the instrument. So it's really telling us nothing about the subsurface. We can actually get at the thickness of our ice sheets, the thickness of our sea ice from radar, but only at the aircraft level. So we've got instruments that work great on aircraft to do, to do that sort of a sonar depth sounding of, of the ice sheets. We can't quite do that from space yet. Hopefully in my lifetime, we'll figure out a way to do that. Uh, but we're not there yet. So what I would like to see, uh, you know, it's hard to send aircraft all over the continent of Antarctica and create the same type of data density that the satellites give us. Uh, but I would hope somehow in my lifetime, I see more of a three-dimensional map of the Antarctic ice sheet. We've got a pretty good one uh, for Greenland. Of course, Greenland's a lot smaller. It's a lot closer to, to major airports. So we've basically given ourselves a three-dimensional sense of Greenland through airborne. Uh, radar data. I'd love to see the same for Antarctica at some point. Great. Um, so we have a couple questions actually coming in from the comments now. Uh, the first question is from uh, Cecilia, um, who asks, uh, if you want to go to Antarctica um, as a scientist, what sorts of things did you study in high school and college? So I just want to reiterate again that there are a lot of people doing all sorts of work, either in direct science support or 
you know, of some of the science that's going down there. So literally almost anything that you can think of to run a small town, <laughs> landing aircraft, providing housing, providing food, uh, providing light science support, all these good things uh, that goes into uh, working in Antarctica. As far as uh, research in Antarctica, I think the big thing I would just say is like math, 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 sorry about that. Uh, and math is a muscle. So uh, keep working at it and keep up with it. Um, but any, so any of the physical sciences, uh, those, that's usually a pretty good path to doing research in Antarctica. If you go to the National Science Foundation's Office of Polar Programs, they have a really good, uh, they'll give you a really good sense of what type of science is currently happening in Antarctica. And, and they've parsed it out sort of by field, like organisms, um, uh, glaciology, geology and geophysics, astrophysics, all sorts of good stuff. So I encourage you to go to NSF Office of Polar Programs to see the sort of broad sense of the physical sciences going on down there. Great, thank you. Um, another question, uh, question I have and sort of a follow-up question uh, from the audience. Um, what, uh, I guess, what was the most surprising aspect of living and doing research in, in Antarctica? And a question from, uh, from Brandy is how long did you stay in Antarctica? So how much time have you spent sort of collectively um, in, in Antarctica doing your research? So I worked in Antarctica for about four seasons. Then I was a, um, a grad student on a project that had three seasons. Can you clarify seasons what the seasons are? Oh, yep. Thank you. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> um, so a full Antarctic field season is their full summer. And again, it's opposite of what we're, we're seeing here. So I would go down in like mid-October and come back in mid-February. So that's the Antarctic summer science season. So I did that for four years. Um, interspersed with that, I had another trip down to um, a, a, a station south of South America that the US runs. Um, so that's five trips right there. Then I went to grad school and had, was on an active project uh, with my advisor. There were three more sort of shorter field seasons. So like early November to mid December or so. Um, then I did a long trip with the Australian program to look at an ice shelf over in sort of their sector of Antarctica. And then I've done three of these uh, 88 South traverses. So let's break these down a little bit. This is about eight weeks door to door to do one of these traverses. Um, but it's really only two weeks out in a very deep field where you're, you're down to just four people and the communication that you have back and forth is uh, just satellite phone maybe once a day. We also had these things called inReach, which uses the satellite uh, phone network to allow you to text. So you could actually text your family and say, hey, everything's going great. And it was a good way to sort of stay in touch. But it's basically just satellite communications only. Um, and that was two solid weeks. So to get at Ralph's question, the surprising stuff, look, we're all quarantining. We're all kind of isolated in probably households of about the same number, you know, four people plus or minus one or two, right? What I really liked was, you know, if you have a question, Google's not gonna answer it. <laughs> You're gonna have to turn around and look at the other folks that are there with you and think about your resources and kind of work together to solve the problems. I really like that. And I also really like, and I hope everyone out there is doing this, but I really like getting to know people better and differently um, when you're in that sort of, you know, tight communal, semi-isolated type state. So I hope everyone out there is doing roughly the same, getting to know their family members maybe a little bit differently, but a little bit better. Thank you. Um, so a couple more questions. Uh, Dan asks, uh, what's your favorite meal in the McMurdo Galley? Oh, gosh. <laughs> so here's the best part. It's this, the McMurdo Galley has to feed, you know, something on the order of, you know, 800 people per meal. It's, they do really amazing work um, down there. And South Pole, they're doing the same uh, for a smaller number of people, you know, maybe 100 or so. Uh, both these communities do a great job feeding large groups of people. And keep in mind, they're restricted by uh, how often the planes come in with fresh food. So they're, in my mind, working miracles <laughs> with, with uh, the resources that they have. Um, I think what's, this is uh, good and bad. Unfortunately, McMurdo has a constant, constant supply of pizza slices. And that's, <laughs> that's good, <laughs> but, but it's also not good. <laughs> so it's kind of nice to just be able to go in and grab a slice whenever you want. <laughs> Nice. Um, 
Question about data uh, and the data you've collected from Jan. Um, were there any surprises in your data um, and does your data coincide uh, with what you expected to see? Yeah, so we've got three years of data now, which is kind of nice. When you have one year, you think you know the answer. When you have, <laughs> when you have more than one year, then you can start, it, start to look at kind of where things are different and try to figure out why. Um, the surface is pretty flat, but we do kind of go up and over a uh, dome. And when I say up and over, if we go a total of 200 or 300 meters of elevation change over 300 kilometers, um, that's a lot. So it's not that much of a change at all, but it's just enough to steer the wind. So what we're seeing is maybe some changes from year to year kind of on the flank, uh, the flanks of that, of that dome. And that sort of surprised us that we were possibly able to see a little bit of change uh, inside a tight time period, um, but possibly associated with uh, what I would call muted topography, kind of gentle topography, but enough to, to have an impact, uh, especially on the wind. Um, a question from Ellie um, asking, um, I guess sort of summarizing, I'll paraphrase the question, uh, basically when time comes for you to sort of uh, pass on the baton to the next generation of scientists doing this research, what, what sort of excites you about that prospect? And um, or what are some of the factors that, that I think uh, are influencing sort of uh, the next generation's ability to do the work? Um, yeah. And, and yeah, what excites you about that? So I think the big thing is we're, we're starting to learn a lot about, um, you know, a large ice sheet with high resolution. In other words, massive data density. We're only really coming to be able to handle that type of data. So cloud computing, um, using high-end computer programs, maybe with uh, sophisticated programming. I am not the world's greatest programmer. I am, I am becoming more efficient in my computer programming out of necessity. And things like that are just gonna get better and better. So we'll be able to handle bigger and bigger data sets, which give us better and better density associated with continent scale type um, observations uh, in coming years. I think that um, our ability to collect the data is a little ahead of our ability to be able to process those data or to interpret those data, especially on say a desktop machine. Uh, we're now jumping into cloud environments to be able to process so much more data uh, kind of at, at your fingertips. So I would like to see us catch up a little bit more on the computer side uh, to be able to handle this because uh, we're only going to be collecting denser and denser data sets as, as time goes on. And I hate to say that's like a data management thing, sorry, but I think it's, <laughs> big data is a, a, an interesting uh, direction right now in, in the sciences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so I think this is a question for, uh, for many of the students who are tuning in um, to just to provide some perspective on you know, what you're learning now and how it might stick with you. Um, what is your most memorable experience uh, from a middle or high school science class? <laughs> so, um... I would, can I, can I jump to math instead? So, <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I, so uh, I remember uh, taking a, a pre-calc class in high school from a guy that just seemed so cold, right? Just, he was, you know, didn't have a warm fuzzy feel to him at all in, in the class. And he was, he was, uh, I don't want to say militant, but a little bit, you know, just, hey, we're learning this, you're doing this today, go. And in hindsight, I think that his sort of, you know, firm uh, pushiness was probably one of the best things that that uh, that I had back then. Um, one of the things we did in his class was I, I think I should have been a cryptographer, not a um, not an ice person, but I remember doing pattern recognition with him, and and uh, I did really well at that. <laughs> That's what I remember is one whole day of trying to find the series and whatnot, and, and he was a, he was a really really good good instructor. I remember when I finally went off to college, you had to take a math test to um, uh, pass into a certain level of, of math. And I remember I passed, you know, out of Calc 2, just from his class, which was fantastic. Uh, my dad said, hey, go back, Don't, you know, just take them, take them at the college level. But in hindsight, I just really appreciate what that guy gave me uh, in my high school. Mr. Austin, Northwest Regional High School, number seven in Northwestern Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I have a question actually from, uh, one of my colleagues, um, uh, is there any uh, citizen science that people can do in their communities yeah. um, that can help us to understand 
uh, data collection, um, or there's just the science and the research being done at the poles a bit better? Yeah, so NASA has a pretty cool project called the GLOBE project, G-L-O-B-E, -O -G GLOBE. Um, I think it was pushed quite a bit by Al Gore, but it was intended to have um, citizen scientists and, and especially school systems figure out how they could actually go and make sort of um, uh, schoolyard measurements in support of NASA satellites or NASA measurements that are happening uh, right now. And we have one, keep in mind, I've been talking about the polar regions, but I said too, is a global mission. We don't turn our lasers on and off when we you know, enter or leave the, the polar regions. We keep them on as we go through the equatorial region. So we have data products that include uh, learning something about our vegetation areas, you know, the, the, the sort of crown and ground of our trees and whatnot that provide information on, on the carbon uh, sink and the, one of the greatest uncertainties associated with the whole carbon cycle. And what we have going on is a globe project that has students measuring tree heights so that we can use that as a validation uh, point for those products, for the tree height um, uh, data products on ISET2. So NASA, globe, and ISET2 should take you to a tree measurement uh, project. Uh, associated with our, our mission. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I think uh, we usually tend to run these for about 40, 45 minutes, um, just scanning to see if we have any more questions. Um, but I did wanna thank you again so much, Dr. Brad, for taking time out of your day to, to talk to us about your research and to put together that great presentation, sort of showing us um, really what it's like to do research um, in an extreme environment like Antarctica and just the important role of um, of the work that you do in terms of helping us to better understand sort of the changes that we're witnessing and experiencing uh, at the poles and the impact that those are gonna have uh, on, on, on our climate and, and, and really in many ways on our way of life moving forward um, as we think about sort of the impacts of climate change. And so I just wanted to use this time as again as an opportunity to remind you all to please check out um, the Polar Extremes uh, film, um, as well as Antarctic Extremes. And again, Polar Extremes is a two hour film. Uh, it's available to stream on the NOVA website. Um, and it's hosted by uh, Kurt Johnson, who's actually gonna be on our next virtual field trip uh, next week uh, for Earth Day. Um, but essentially the film takes uh, us and viewers on an epic journey uh, through time uh, to the polar extremes of the planet and really looking and following clues um, that really help to reveal uh, the ways in which uh, the climate at the poles has changed and how in a way they, they, they help to moderate in, uh, many of the, the climate systems that we see across the rest of the world um, and the dramatic changes that we're witnessing now, what that may mean for our future. And so uh, definitely check out the two hour film. Uh, Antarctic Extremes is also, stream, is also available on YouTube. It is a 10 part digital series uh, on the PBS Terra page uh, featuring uh, two uh, great reporters uh, from NOVA who spent some time in Antarctica and really sort of um, share highlights uh, from their journey there and, and what it's like to do research um, in that environment. And then the Polo Lab, uh, which you can hop on and start playing right now, um, which is a interactive uh, web-based game that takes you um, through different missions across the globe, uh, really sort of uncovering uh, and playing through different mini games um, that, uh, that help you better understand sort of the science and the research that's being done um, to better understand paleoclimates and, and the changes that we're witnessing um, at the polls as well. So definitely thank you so much again for tuning in to this conversation. Thank you again, Dr. Brunt, for taking time to speak with us. Um, again, uh, please check out uh, those films. You can also check out some of the research. Um, is there a place that people can go to to check out the research that you're doing, Dr. Brunt? Yeah, isat2.gsfc.nasa.gov. You can just Google isat2 and NASA, it'll take you there. Okay, and that's isat and then dash two. Um, where you can find information about the research and the data it's collected. Is some of that data actually available for people to sort of view Oh yeah, you online? It, it's, yes. <laughs> yep, and they'll, it'll push you right to that link as well. Great, awesome. And again, um, this um, live stream will be archived on the Nova Education page, so feel free to revisit it um, if you'd like to. Um, thank you again so much for joining us, everyone. Please uh, continue to stay safe, um, continue to stay at home, um, maintain social distancing, follow the proper hygiene procedures. Um, and uh, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, have a great day, everyone.